Okay, we're live. We do have a participant in, so welcome. Um, we're going to go ahead and kick off the show. We only have an hour here. Um, so basically, welcome to Love a Compact Live. I'm Adam Hernandez. I am the communications chair on the board of Love a Compact which is a nonprofit here in Lubbock um, that is focused on good governance and uh, helping out communities all across the city. So Lubbock Compact Live, uh, the reason why we decided to do this is because there's a lot of information that comes from City Hall that most citizens are just not aware of. Um, and a lot of things that uh, would benefit from citizen input and citizen engagement. And so we try to uh, keep the public informed about those things and also um, provide some information about how you can get involved um, if you so choose. And so also along with that, we would like to bring on guests on our episodes that uh, can further uh, either help the mission of the Love of Compact or in general help the community of Lubbock to be more informed and to know what's going on and uh, some things they can get involved in and also to answer some questions that anybody may have. And so that's basically what Lubbock Compact Live is. Um, I'll let Dr. Nicholas Bergfeld introduce himself. He will be my co-host on each episode. And so go ahead, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great to, to see everybody participating and, and for those who are going to be watching on the recording, uh, really thankful for your engagement. Uh, citizens becoming informed is a core and essential part of a functioning city. Uh, my name is Nick Berkfeld. I am on the advisory board of the Lubbock Compact as well as the policy advisor uh, for the organization. And what we hope to do in this is, is to really provide uh, a space for conversation around the issues of importance within our community uh, and then also to show ways for you to be able to plug in and engage uh, in our everyday lives here in the city of Lubbock as well as the planning for the future and what our city can be for generations going forward. Um, so I'll be doing uh, more of the updates on uh, news as well as the ongoings in the city of Lubbock uh, as we move forward in these uh, conversations. Awesome. And we're also joined today by Josh Shankles, who was our coordinator for the Garden City Initiative for Lubbock Compact. So we will get into that a little bit uh, later after um, Nick gives you some updates. But first, uh, we'd like to kind of let everybody know about the initiative that we have going on with charter reform right now. And so what's going on is the Lubbock City Charter is being reformed so that there's a few things we're looking at there. Uh, we're looking at the term length for the mayor uh, to be four years instead of two, um, because currently the city council member terms are four years. And so uh, we're just trying to make those match. Um, and there's some other reasons why that's a good idea. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at doing in the uh, city charter is to actually raise the pay of what city council members and the mayor are paid. Now, uh, once whatever amount that is passes, this does not affect any city council members. So I just wanna put that out there. Uh, so if any of those guys aren't your favorite, <laughs> um, it's not gonna affect anybody that's sitting on the council currently. So uh, the other thing that we were trying to take a look at is the citizen petition process, um, trying to make that a little more modern and also uh, done in a way to where it will protect tax, taxpayers from having to um, foot the bill for unnecessary legal costs and things that can come from uh, an illegal ordinance uh, being passed, for instance. And so um, what we found out is that in February, the uh, city council created a charter review committee that's going to begin meeting next Wednesday, the 24th, and they're going to meet every Wednesday from then on until June 2nd. And the, the purpose of this committee is going to be for them to uh, consider the city council pay and all these different things we just spoke about. And also there's some language cleanup in the city charter that they're not changing any laws or anything. It's just removing old outdated language and things of that nature. So that's kind of what they're going to be doing through that process. There are going to be two of those meetings where they take public input. And uh, this is the part where we're appealing to citizens to be involved in that and to just kind of follow, uh, follow us along on Facebook or our website, that's lovecompact.com, uh, or you can follow us on our Facebook page, which is just Love of Compact. And we uh, will keep everybody uh, updated as far as when we know uh, 
when those dates will be when you can do public comments because there will only be two of those meetings where public comments will be taken and one of those meetings has to be after regular work hours so if you work till five or something and you haven't been able to make comments in the past there will be one of those where you can um, do that and so that's basically what's going on with charter reform also we need the most people possible to come out and vote on november 2nd which is when the charter reform will actually be on a ballot because the citizens actually make the final decision and so um Again, just really quick, we need a lot of people to give public comments to say what you would be approve, uh, what you would approve of as far as the salary for the city council, and uh, and then to come out and vote on November second and uh, make your stance official in that way. So that's pretty much what we have going on uh, outside of the Garden City Initiative, which Josh will be speaking about a little bit later. And right now, uh, Dr. Nick has some local Lubbock news and updates about the city. So Nick? Yeah, and as we go forward, uh, please reach out to us on social media channels uh, for topics or, or news stories that you think it's important for us to be able to cover uh, during this time. Uh, your feedback and insights on ongoings around the city of Lubbock is a really important aspect of how we stay informed uh, and know the topics that are of interest. Um, so to take it off from the top, um, a COVID update. Um, so this is something that is relevant today because we are um, on the one year anniversary mark of the first cases of COVID reported within our community. Um, I think for a lot of us, if you, if you reflect upon um, the, one of the first infamous cases, the, the Rosa's uh, case for the Texas Tech student, and just how uninformed many of us were at the time, uh, and the lack of information or understanding, um, the fear and the uncertainty of how it was that we would move forward together. And, you know, since that point in time, you know, what has happened? We've had over 48,000 cases confirmed uh, here through testing. Uh, and an average of two Lubbock citizens have died uh, every day since the beginning of this pandemic. Now, what's great is that we are turning the corner on this issue. Uh, in fact, today, uh, the city's most recent numbers on their vaccination clinic has it so that we've almost hit the 48,000 mark uh, for individuals receiving their first vaccines. And we're almost at the 15% mark for individuals in the city of Lubbock that have received both doses of the vaccine. Um, so within the next couple days, we'll actually have had more individuals vaccinated in our community than have actually had the COVID virus. Um, this is an enormous accomplishment, and it, we really all need to give a lot of thanks to the public health department of the city of Lubbock uh, and our rock star public health director, Catherine Wells, who has really been able to lead the vaccination effort, uh, which is such great um, uh, poise uh, and understanding of the ways in which that outreach was necessary, uh, and how to bring together a mass vaccination clinic uh, using almost entirely volunteers uh, from the city community. Um, so this is really all about us uh, and, and the contributions that we've all made to this effort. If you are now over the age of 50, uh, uh, go to the city's website and use the select to see features uh, to register for getting a vaccine or uh, getting vaccinated. Um, but what's so great about where we are right now in our numbers in the city of Lubbock is that it's very likely that accessibility for um, even other categories that haven't been uh, designated yet in our community will be getting vaccinated quite soon. Um, already, uh, the health department is seeing a certain number of additional uh, vac extra vaccines on, on some of their days, and so they're allowing for a certain number of walk-ins as well. Uh, tune into uh, various local news, uh, as well as the city's uh, public health department website for announcements on that. Uh, to make sure that you have the opportunity to get vaccinated. Uh, and so as, as we kind of go forward in these things, um, you know, we'll, we'll sort of mix it up in terms of interesting topics. Uh, the next one to talk about is a topic that everybody loves to hate, Citizens Tower, uh, which is just sort of the, the gift that just keeps on giving. Um, so in our most recent rainstorm uh, in the past week, uh, Citizens Tower ended up flooding. Uh, the $64 million project uh, continues to be something of a boondoggle uh, for both the, citizen, the citizens of our community as well as the city council. Um, what's tragic about this story uh, is the fact that it's, it's one of these good examples of uh, where sort of government planning, because of the, the changing cycles of politicians and elections, sometimes things can just simply get out of hand. Uh, and so while our city council today is oftentimes flamed and roasted 
uh, for Citizens Tower, the thing that I would point out is that the majority of them really had nothing to do with the initial parts of the purchase of the building um, or the initial sort of planning for what this would cost. Uh, and so as a result of that, you know, we're just sort of stuck with this. Uh, not, not that anybody can actually openly say out loud that Citizens Tower is garbage, uh, but there really isn't even a city council member who would, you know, in hindsight, think of this as, as a meaningful project. And in fact, the former mayor, Glenn Robertson, who oversaw this initiative in the beginning, uh, ended up becoming one of the only council members during the time of the renovations to begin voting against uh, moving forward with the Citizens Tower project. Uh, now, there's actually a certain amount of irony in that. Uh, because the mayor, Glenn Robertson at the time, also stated that he believed Citizens Tower to be his biggest regret or the biggest failure of the city council during his tenure. Um, what is a bit ironic is that he's also the only city council member to profit uh, off of Citizens Tower in, in an article, I believe, that was in KCBD, uh, where they pointed out that as this process went forward, uh, he actually purchased an adjacent parcel of land next to the property that was going to have to be purchased by the city of Lubbock in order for the project to go forward and sold it back to the city of Lubbock um, as part of that process. So this is an unfortunate project that has a bit of a tragic lineage uh, within our community and one that I, I think we are all still trying to find a way to come to terms with. Um, even on the city staffing side, uh, I remember hearing commentary from city staff at the time of the Citizens Tower project that many of the departments had to set their expected growth rate for employees to zero in order to justify how their departments could actually fit into the building. Um, and so this is something that we'll continue to see issues with. Uh, the flooding damage, it's unclear uh, exactly how much the cost for the repairs will be. Um, it damaged the uh, sub-basement as well as deactivated the elevators uh, currently and has also rendered inoperable uh, the utility, customer service utility center uh, for the time being. Um, you know, this is something that we all have to be aware of. Um, it's something that as a community uh, we need to acknowledge this and recognize that we need better senses of oversight and transparency within our community whenever we are making these sort of big budget, big dollar uh, purchases. Uh, the last update that I'll talk about today uh, is an important topic that we want citizens in Lubbock to start to get engaged in. Uh, the city is going through a big overhaul of the way in which that neighborhoods are zoned in our community. Uh, this new document will be called the Unified Development Code. Uh, and in this document, um, they incorporate a lot of new learnings in, in urban design and development around how new neighborhoods in the city of Lubbock should be built. Uh, as you can see, and in, in one of the challenges that we have in our older neighborhoods in the Lubbock community uh, is that we don't have a lot of diverse activities that are allowed to exist within them. Uh, and in fact, whenever they lose their elementary schools, oftentimes these neighborhoods uh, just simply become purely residential dormitories. Uh, without any economic activity or, or uh, amenities that would attract middle class or uh, families to want to be there. Uh, it leads to a downward trend uh, where eventually home ownership declines uh, significantly and property values decline within the community. Um, and so as a result of that, there's been a lot of learnings uh, on what we know and how zoning reform can be a powerful tool uh, for engagement. Um, now, the challenge on this topic is that as part of the process for creating the Unified Development Code, uh, the consultants who have made these documents that the city will ultimately determine whether or not they'll adopt, they've left out recommendations for zoning reform, even though they have an understanding of new styles of development, that they include recommendations for new subdivisions to have, they do nothing to change the restrictions that prevent our neighborhoods from being able to find ways uh, to revitalize. And so this is a topic that we very much so want citizens to engage in. Um, from a policy standpoint, it is the best opportunity that we have uh, to be able to promote revitalization through city government. And I know for a lot of people that might seem a bit crazy, the idea that city government can do that, but really it's just essentially doing a series of free market reforms to unlock the value of properties that are within our community today. And so the example that I'll leave us with is to think about the value of properties in the North Tech Terrace neighborhood. A typical North Tech Terrace homeowner, and that neighborhood is predominantly homeowners, uh, is able to have a back house, an accessory dwelling unit is the new term for that, uh, on their property because of the fact that they were built some time ago and, and they were built as part of Texas Tech's expansion um, um, after World War II and the GI Bill. Now, for individuals that have those homes, they're able to get value off their land. 
And, and in fact, the rental prices for an accessory dwelling unit in North Tech Terrace can range anywhere from 550 to around $850 a month. If you think about that, uh, these are individuals that have the ability to actually generate value from their land just simply because of the fact that they live near Texas Tech. Um, think about the opportunities that we're missing out on because of the fact that these types of benefits of being able to maximize the value of your land uh, are not available to all of us. And so as we move forward in this process, um, one of the first city meetings that will happen that uh, you'll be able to plug in on, on this uh, will be the next city council meeting uh, on next Thursday, um, or sorry, next uh, the 25th, I mean, uh, on March 25th. And at that, the U to C consultants will be presenting some of the recommendations to the city council. Uh, there'll be more from us on providing public comment uh, and getting more engaged in this topic as it's one of critical importance and something that we don't wanna lose uh, is part of the calendar for this year. Uh, the ultimate recommendations from the UDC council uh, or from the UDC consultants uh, will be submitted to uh, the city council um, sometime in uh, September. So uh, stay tuned for that. And those are some of the news updates uh, around the city. Please uh, use our social media to engage us uh, and provide us with any things that you think we should comment on or look into as well. Adam, back to you. Yeah, so, all right, great updates today. We got a lot going on. Um, so now is the part of the show where we get to speak to our guests. So Mr. Josh, um, he is our coordinator of our Garden City Initiative within Lubbock Compact. And uh, Josh, you wanted to tell them what a little bit of the background of uh, Garden City Initiative, what it is, why, and why now? Hey, I, I, I just blew in. To the inaugural episode, a little topical humor today. Um, yeah, I, as Adam said, my name is Josh Shankles, and I serve on the governing board. And um, I, as the uh, coordinator for a series of initiatives that we're calling Garden City, and um, you know, we we started this in a real quiet way in 2020. We, you know, had, had taken on a lot of really big um, initiatives, especially, um, you know, as you both well know, like what we dug into with impact fees really like sucked up a lot of bandwidth. But um, we, we started this work because we were looking at other model communities, uh, particularly Amarillo, and how they budget for neighborhood like organized neighborhoods to be able to use a, a, a budget allotment for development of different resources within their own communities and so we were looking how at how to replicate and model that and we thought that parks and green spaces were kind of a natural fit for this sort of thing and so we wanted to kind of make um, some menu options and you know, look around our, our own community and see where we can plug into where this initi this issue is already going on. Um, you know, as you all know, probably one of you guys like developed this, right? We've got this like, we these five principles that we started early in our advocacy work. And um, one of them is um, to, let's see, to protect and preserve, right? And so we were, we were kind of, you know, referencing our own um, values here and, and kind of um, looking at opportunities where we could, you know, not only be like uh, reacting to, to policy that was in action and, and things that were going on, but also like um, creating, uh, uh, proactively creating policy for the city, right? Um, and so, yeah, like, like looking at this value to protect and preserve, we like jumped into this in a quiet way by um, really partnering up with stakeholders and kind of learning what the landscape of Lubbock's uh, parks and green spaces looked like and who the stakeholders were um, and doing some real quiet um, volunteering and sponsorship and, uh, you know, advocacy message amplification, particularly for like the the city's community gardens. Um, so 
you know, that's, that's what we've been up to largely. Um, then late 2020, we found out that the city who had just hired a new parks and recreation director was going to initiate, um, uh, like revamping the city's mass parks and recreation master plan, which is the last one was done quite a while back, right? Right, right. So there is like a 2011 and then a 2001. They're they're kind of on like a, a 10 year cycle, right? You know, like city work, there's a lot to get done. Some of this stuff only happens once a decade. So here we are in 2020. We got a new parks director. It's been a decade. It's time to update this document. This is going to be a document that kind of uh, governs and outlay, out, uh, outlines the policy um, and uh, you know uh, development priorities of the parks and recreation system. And so it's so, sort of like a land use plan, but just only for parks, pretty much. It, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, I not to knock on the people that developed this, but the 2011 one is, you know, it's, it's pretty basic, it's pretty routine, but it gets down to some some brass text, and, and so you can expect that a document like this kind of like tracks the continuity of the park system and uh, informs policymakers on what it is that the public wants to see out of the park system. Awesome. So, and, and uh, I, I understand that you, well, I know, but for the people out there, uh, you've met with the, the new uh, parks planning guy, right? Um, yeah. So what kind of, what, what, is, what, what, what does the process look like going forward to develop this master plan? Kind of what are some of his motivations? Cause I know he's looking into um, maybe possibly getting more grants for the city. Uh, is that correct? Right. Yeah. That's, that's all correct. And you know, let me back it up, you know, one step, right? We got into this because we were, we were looking to make positive policy for the city in the area of parks and green space, particularly because um, their, their benefit for human health and for the stability of, the, of neighborhoods, you know, the home prices and the desirability of communities, parks, um, really build on this and there are a lot of communities across our city that are suffering from the negative effects of either health or um, like home ownership and, and home value uh, because of a history of school closures and zoning particularly in it, especially where it relates to this issue um, and so you know, when we look at the disparity report, when we look at research that's been done by other groups like Texas Housers, uh, the Trust for Public Lands has a lot of really interesting mapping and statistics on where Lubbock ranks in America's 100 largest cities, 93rd, by the way, um, as far as parks amenities. Um, it, you know, the CDC and trade organizations have tons of research about this. So when we look at all this, we see that the parks and, and green spaces and tree canopy are all uh, very viable ways to, to interject on uh, deleterious development in communities and neighborhoods, right? Okay, so now that's why we got into it. So yes, we have engaged with the new parks department director. He seems, you know, very straightforward guy. He has a lot to manage. He doesn't want to spend his whole day talking to me, but he is very interested in securing um, money for the city, and he's he's actually qualified for this job, which is something that we haven't particularly had before. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you guys want to. Anyway, I can see. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm really optimistic about where he wants to carry this process, and and one thing he has repeatedly said is that he wants a robust engagement strategy for what the public wants. And so we're going to hold them to account on that issue. Um, additionally, you know, we, we thought it was the right time to jump in on this because when this came up in front of the council, everybody was really excited about it. And so we're like, well, great, you know, maybe we, this could be a total win because they seem to want to do it. And the parks director seems to want to do it. And people, you know, who doesn't like parks? Like, give me a break. Um, and so, you know, everything's kind of converging at the right time for us to hit this issue. 
Yeah, it's that. Uh, that's some great information. And just a real quick reminder for anybody that may be watching on the Facebook Live, you can also put your uh, questions in the comments there. Um, and we do have a moderator that will get us those questions. Um, and, and, of course, if you want to join the Zoom, you can ask questions in the Q&A chat. Um, but just wanted to put that out there. So, okay, with all that said, Josh, um, so kind of what are, what are the next steps? What does the uh, engagement kind of look like? Uh, in this process okay well you know uh, and you'll have to please do jump in and like bring me in because it, it's wonky there's like a couple of different angles you know uh, those of you that have been following our work for a minute know we're kind of like opportunistic and sort of like grabbing on to like whatever looks like a good avenue to advance some of our causes so um, so what's going to happen the, the city is hired a consulting firm that is going to do the they're going to create the work product what the what the master plan is right and uh we haven't actually been told a whole lot about what that process will look like entirely um except again you know if if you're going kind of off of what has historically been done there will be a, a series of public engagement campaigns they've done some polling before you know, even as we speak right now, there's like, a, you know, on the city website, there's like a come comment on our downtown front yard park going on right now. So I imagine that the city's going to be engaged. I know that the city's going to be engaging in a robust campaign to get citizens to come with their comments. So, you know, we want to amplify that message and make sure people know when and where they can take their, you know, multitude of, of wants out of this important um, aspect of, of our city life, you know. Um, I can imagine during COVID that a lot of us kind of rediscovered how important our parks and outdoor spaces were and are. And so, um, you know, and as we've said, this, this document process is going to govern the next decade of our city, you know, so we want to really get in there and, and, um, get citizens engaged in what they want. Um, we have been uh, actively engaging with s stakeholders in this area, particularly like neighborhood associations and community organizations um, to, to maybe develop a, a list of asks out of this process that are, are a little bit more targeted at, at larger scope, you know? So, so these asks aren't like, we want a toddler's playground at, you know, the corner of McKenzie Park. Um, th these will be like bigger strategic asks to, or uh, bigger projects to be included in the plan. And so we're, we're talking to stakeholders to see what it is that they want, because as you all know, you know, we invite that sort of engagement. We, we want to be facilitators for that sort of process and, um, and so don't want to presume what it is that communities want. We would like them to, you know, um, we'd like to facilitate bringing their ideas to, to bear. And so um, in engaging with these, uh, these key partners, you know, we're, um, we're asking what it is that they want. We're going to be developing a list of asks and we're going to be ha asking them to sign on to this and kind of all of us engage in that advocacy efforts together on these most key issues. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I, I really like to see the citizens come out for this in a robust way because um, yeah. this is going to be important for our environment, for our, our public life, our, uh, uh, you know, unlocking our creativity, our imagination. There's a lot that goes into this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I agreed. And uh, really quick, Nick, um, just another reminder for anybody watching. Um, You'll kind of hear us talk about this a lot as far as trying to get more people engaged um, because a lot of times what happens is that the, the things that we don't like, that we're not very happy with, that we complain about for a lot of years, um, there was probably some point when they took uh, citizen input and basically nobody showed up. So uh, that's kind of the issue we're dealing with. So really important to get inv involved with this. Um, and, and Nick, I, I guess you had a, a question or a comment for Josh? Yeah, because I, you know, I, I feel like we should, um, 
you know, Josh, you're, you're an organic farmer. We, have, we haven't talked about that. Um, but I'm, I'm curious from, from your background and the way that you look at our city today, um, how are we doing on, on green space? You know, we, we have these big Playa Lake um, parks, I'll say, Playa Lake parks. Um, you know, where do we, you know, is, is there a way to measure us? You know, what, how do we stand up in terms of where we are today as, as a community when it comes to, to green space or uh, green efforts? Dude, okay, let, yes, I am a farmer, and, uh, but, but let me preface and say I'm like, would not presume to be an expert in civil planning or parks or really even plants. I mean, you can see the amount of disasters that I turn out, you know. Um, but what, what I can say is that I, I'm an interested citizen and I try to do my homework. And um, so, as I said, the trust, there, there, are lo there are lots of organizations that create standards, that have metrics, those exist, you know. As I said before, the Trust for Public Lands ranks out America's 100 largest cities. Uh, and, you know, they have different standards that have to do with accessibility and acres per capita and, you know, what features and amenities people's park spaces have. And of the 100 largest cities in America, Lubbock ranks number 93. Ooh. Not a great showing. Um, the, there's a... a National Parks and Recreation Association, and they also have some standards. So, like for instance, in the 2011 master plan, the number one recommendation put out by that plan is that the city should create more neighborhood parks. Hmm. Okay, and this is a specific designation for a park that is small in size and embedded within a neighborhood. Okay, oh. so this is like Booker T. Washington Park. This is like uh, Wheelock Park, mm. you know, small and entirely contained in a neighborhood. Uh, the next designation up is a community park, okay, and these are, these are like maxi, mm. okay, um, and they, they are, are like the Arboretum Park, you know, mm. they serve a bigger community and they kind of maybe touch different neighborhoods, um, and, and have like a bigger scope, a bigger purpose, they might have specific features, like like fields or something like that anyway um and and then there's you know big regional ones and the canyon lake system kind of counts as that in fact you know it's actually a huge asset that our city has mm -hmm. okay so um as i said that that 2011 master plan called for there to be more neighborhood parks and that really aligns with one of the things that we've been saying is that neighborhood this stabilizes neighborhoods both mm. their their public life and their their cost and value you know so that was 10 years ago how much work have they done on that not as much as we probably need um but you know the national parks and recreation association also has standards on this where it says like there should be one to two acres per 1000 people of community parks that size and orientation and, and Lubbock said about 1.4, okay? So we're like middle of the road, right? But our neighborhood level parks, like the ones that are a little bit bigger, have a little bit more features, the recommendations are five to eight acres per 1,000 people. But we're actually only at three. So here we fall like way under, okay? And, and so it depends on what lens you're kind of looking at, okay? So if you... The, uh, the Trust for Public Lands, like they have a mapping function and on that mapping function, it helps them, you picture where it is that they suggest parks should go, okay? And part of that is about the walkability. Well, when you consider the, the positioning of the Canyon Lake system, it actually makes like the North and East side look pretty good on like the access area and the acreage area, mm. right? But our case is and has been you know, you can speak to the, I, I'd be curious what you guys have to say about this, that because, you know, the city dumping grounds and heavy mm -hmm. industry and heavy rail and waste processing and, uh, you know, giant agribuildings and warehouses are all concentrated into those neighborhoods and they are 
polluters and they are light polluters and they are noise polluters and they are nuisances and they're eyesores, then when you, when you look at this map created by the Trust for Public Lands, it isn't giving you kind of an accurate picture of how much more those areas need a robust expansion of green space to offset this problematic thing that already exists over there, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, metrics exist, maps exist, they're helpful, but you know, you kind of have to like cross compare a bunch of them and know some history and, and, and some, some work that's been done in this area by us and other groups. Awesome, so uh, pretty much Lubbock sucks <laughs> in, the, uh, in the parks department. Um, but yeah. uh, no, I mean, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. right, yeah. right. I'm just, I'm being, I'm being funny, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we could definitely, uh, there's room for improvement. That's a better way to put it, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, the thing that encourages, encourages me about that is, um, the new parks guy, and I'm, I'm blanking out on his name, uh, right now, but uh, I was able to see him when, when he originally came on. Um, I was actually at the city. Uh, council meeting when he first made his first presentation and and the thing that struck me that uh, has me really encouraged about the whole thing is that he was very adamant about seeking grants because he he kind of showed the numbers of like there was an era in Lubbock I want to say it was like between the maybe like the late 70s and like the 90s or something there was like a certain time frame where they, uh, the city was getting a lot of grants and that's why we have a lot of the big parks that we have with all the stuff they have in them now. Um, some of them in North Lowe's, things of that nature. Um, and and uh, he said that he showed how there was a lapse between like pretty much like the 90s until now, like they have not really actively sought after those grants. And so um, he was really uh, adamant about uh, getting things in line to uh, seek after more grants. And the, the other thing is that the mayor and uh, Randy Christian, at least, are very uh, enthusiastic about helping out with, in the parks area. So that's pretty good. And, and, and the, uh, what you were saying about the uh, industrial areas and things of that nature kind of leads me into a question we got from Facebook from uh, Leanne Vines. And uh, she says, what are some of the big ideas you're looking at? So uh, one of the big ideas, of course, we are looking at is trying to do something about those industrial areas, right? Try to get those moved um, and, and, and do something different in those areas. But kind of what are some of the other big, uh, big picture ideas uh, that, that we're kind of looking at with Garden City Initiative? Well, okay. So, as I said before, the, the thing that we're truly interested in is what does our community want out of this? You know, we, we like our, our ideas, we have ideas, uh, but you know, I, I'm really proud of them. But, um, you know, we, we first wanna be facilitators. Okay, so that being said, right? Um, one, you know, very tangible, simple. Put this, to pack it away, put it to bed. The National Arbor Day Foundation has two different programs, one is, one is run um where it's like a res it's like a recognition and the city has to meet certain conditions to fulfill that recognition that that recognition mm -hmm. and among them are you know having a board to take care of this issue and investing a certain amount of money per capita that's really pretty small potatoes and and having an observation it's really pretty simple the city should join it and be working on increasing the tree canopy in Lubbock. Additionally, there's a, another program run through the utility company where the utility company purchases trees and shows utility users where they should be planted on their property so that they can benefit from utility savings, okay? There's two things that the city could join for minimal cost that would hugely benefit the tree canopy of Lubbock, which would hugely benefit the urban heat island that Lubbock represents, because we, we all live here. We know it is super hot here, okay? This is something that we need to invest in, and also something where we see some disparities around the city, you know, like Chapman Hill looks a lot different than Rush. Um, and so, you know, they're two really easy, concrete, simple things. Now, that's not a big idea. I wouldn't 
you know, there's so many things here and I could really, gosh, I wish we had like 20 hours and the attention span to do it, but I really talk about a lot of things. That's not a big idea. And that's one of the things that I think deserves some recognition is like, uh, we have people in green spaces already that we need to, we need to support and protect, you know, and, and, and fully engage with them. Um, and, and so there's one avenue, uh, we don't need to create all new policy. It, good policy is already out there, right? We just need to follow that good policy. And, you know, here's one in green spaces and, you know, m maybe we'll chop it up. I, I'd love for us to get, you know, what you, what UDC, what codes could do for green policy. Um, you know, but I, I would be so off base if I didn't say that, you know, this could really unlock people's imagination we could have something that's really beautiful, that's really creative, that has a lot of design potential, that has a lot of power as a tourist benefit, as a, an attraction across the city. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm not creative or artistic enough to design that, but we have people that are, you know, and we can see good examples of that when we look across other communities, particularly ones that might do something to address this industrial buildings problem we have on the North and East side, like, New York City's High Line Park, um, or uh, where, where they repurpose like train bridges and different industrial buildings that connected with train lines, you know, or Atlanta's Beltway Project, where they like connected a whole ton of city neighborhoods along a train line all around the city, um, or uh, Seattle's Freeway Park, where they built a park system over the freeway and kind of covered the freeway in their downtown area with a park system. So there are uh, interesting creative ideas. You know, indeed, I would be super remiss if I didn't mention that the Roots Historical Arts Council has been promoting a fascinating and, and really remarkable park idea um, for an East Side Gateway Park that uh, would incorporate all sorts of moving sculptures and a performance art space and different food truck venues. And so, um, yeah, people have great ideas out there. We want to bring those to the forefront. But um, yeah, I would, I would love to see uh, a, a big, as, as the questioner asked, you know, I would love to see a big idea come out of this and really unlock the, this community's potential. You know, I'm, yeah. yeah, people are always like, "Oh, there's nothing to do here. We could change right. that." Yeah, and 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 uh, yeah, I, I like the fact that you bring up that we're more concerned about what the citizens want, right? What the communities want, because really, and that's why we we've kept really, uh, in my mind at least, why we've kind of kept to those uh, bigger, vague uh, goals of more tree canopy and kind of moving the industrial areas. Um, because those are kind of big picture things, right? But um, yeah, we, again, plugging it again, we need community input and engagement. And it's just so important that, that all communities, because there, there are some communities in Lubbock um, who historically just have not uh, gotten in on these processes and, and, and had their voices heard, um, which they've had some help because they feel like they're not heard most of the time. Um, but we, we should still try it. And so we have a follow-up question uh, from Leanne. And so she said the lake at around 72nd and Slide Road used to have cattail reed, which was a wildlife habitat and also created visual interest. They cut those down and keep, the, and, and keep them out. Uh, I'm wondering if more natural habitat can be promoted in our parks. So I don't, I don't know if you've had any um, indication of that or uh, is that something, do you think maybe that's another one of those ideas we bring to the public input. Um, what do you think about that? Dude, I'm, I'm going to quickly just say one thing and then hand it up to Nick. Maybe he has more to say about this. But um, I had a conversation with the mayor about this whole issue. He's excited and interesting. Give him full credit on that. Um, and he specifically mentioned Playa Lakes and how it, it used to be and maybe still is a, a part of our development. Um, strategy that Playa Lakes were often set aside as public spaces. Now, the city might still have to maintain them and clear brush and do all that, and that, that's worthy of looking at, I would say for sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, the mayor himself brought this up. It's something that is at least on the radar, if, if that can be any indication of that. Um, it, the Playa Lakes 
give us kind of like a natural pattern of where parks and environmental set-asides could happen and, and they're hard to develop anyway. And so I think people are pretty open-minded to that idea and preserving that idea because of course, parks and green spaces aren't just for humans. They are for the everything else on the planet that we share our communities with. And that is very worthy in my opinion. Uh, I do imagine, I, and I think I've read, you know, I, I, Nick can give me an education. I bet you've done it more digging on this now. Um, but in the UDC code, in the draft language for this universal development code, there are, um, th there are some places where they address like leaving these environmentally significant uh, areas uh, as set asides in development. Did you, did you see any of that? Yeah, yeah, and so this is this is one of the good elements that I, I think as we're trying to talk to the city of Lubbock about why these things are beneficial, oftentimes showing them, you know, what these consultants and, and the UDC consultants for the city, um, you know, they're 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 good quality, they're they're top tier. The recommendations that they're making are, are things that are consistent uh, with what's known on how you can um, you know most effectively utilize public dollars. Uh, for these types of projects. And so, you know, one of the, the things that they do include is, is certain um, standards for new styles of design, um, which, which they call sort of cluster neighborhood or cluster neighborhood design. Um, and they describe some of the parameters around this idea of shared space uh, within them. And one of the hopes for the new subdivisions is that by making these things explicit, and showing developers the process and, and the zoning designations that now exist that they can use off the shelf rather than them having to kind of think of this on their own or uh, try to figure these things out. Um, the hope is that more of them will start to adopt uh, and utilize some of these newer approaches, which uh, do in include efforts to set aside pieces of land. Um, and there are actually even, you know, in, in one of our, our previous um, advocacy efforts and impact fees, um, you know, there are even conversations in other communities around the idea uh, of impact fee reductions uh, or, or bonuses uh, for developers that utilize um, these kind of more, uh, these styles that, that set aside pieces in the neighborhood to make sure that there are shared community amenities. Um, because what we find is that on some of these topics, it really is about um, how you, you set these neighborhoods up in the beginning really kind of determines the trajectory of that. You know, so if you set aside the land in the beginning, if you start with that structure, um, it's very likely that you'll be able to find creative ways to finance that space uh, as well. And, and so, you know, a good example of that here in Lubbock uh, is the North Point neighborhood, which has a public improvement district, uh, which is a special kind of designation where a certain amount of additional property taxes, a small amount, uh, come from the individuals in the, in the community and that goes into a bucket of money um, that has certain privileges that can then be used to maintain park space or other types of amenities within a neighborhood. Now, if you're not a developer who just knows all the ins and outs of, of how to make all these things happen, it's just not something that's on your radar. Um, and so you're, you're not looking at it. It's not something that you would meaningfully consider. And so the hope is on some of the new recommendations for new subdivisions, uh, we'll see this start to happen in those communities. Um, the challenge I think right now becomes um, how do we, while we acknowledge that those things are well and good and we're going to do them in the future, what do we do to rectify the deficits um, that we have in our current communities? You know, how do we find ways to, to bring sort of community activity and green space, um, not just parks, but also things like community gardens, which, which I'd love to hear you uh, talk about and, and sort of, you know, where are we at as a community when it comes to community gardens, I, I actually was part of a, the Hunger and Horticulture Initiative with the Texas Hunger Initiative uh, some years back. And, and one of the things that I, I found surprising uh, was how you know community gardens in Lubbock, it seems like they can kind of rise and fall um, when it comes to engagement um, and finding a, a way to sustain themselves. You know, what have been, what have been challenges there and um, you know, how are, are those things that we should sort of look for in the future? Dude, yeah, I'm going to slide one more under the wire, which is to say that if we would reverse our sprawl policy, mm. we wouldn't be claiming up all this extra land and we could leave it for the environment instead of covering it in. 
our development, but I digress. Uh, yeah, there are several active community gardens in Lubbock, uh, some of which are, are like kind of just came back online last year or just come now. It's wonderful to see. Um, so uh, there's the Booker T. Washington Community Garden um, over in the Chapman Hill neighborhood. There's the now getting active Guadalupe Garden. In yeah, Guadalupe that's amazing. Neighbor. I saw the post on that. I know. Yeah. It's, uh, they, they, uh, kudos to these people. They slid it past us and we're going to keep it a surprise. I was so pleased to see it. Uh, Heart of Lubbock in, in kind of the central neighborhoods of Lubbock, specifically the Heart of, neighborhood, or Heart of Lubbock neighborhood and the Volunteer Garden um, over in the Aigton area. So headed towards the west, but still central part. And then there also uh, is a community garden at the Lubbock Dream Center. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and there, there very well could be others, you know, please come at us, tell us, tell us where you're growing. Um, these are uh, fantastic organizations that support their communities that they, they live in uh, and uh, they're a really important place for people to get access to fresh food, to get knowledge about how to do this and replicate this, and to, for people to engage in community. Like, you have to have space to have community in. Um, and so all of these groups do remarkable work in this area. They, they do tend to cycle, and I'll go, you know, right back to where we started is uh, our, our principle of protect and preserve. Mm. is that uh, these, these spaces, green spaces in general, are going to get ever increasingly important as our, as our world carries forward in our city, especially if we intend to increase the density of our city, which we should. Um, and so it's going to be really important that the green space that we have, the parks that we have, the community gardens that we have, that we engage with them and take care of them if it is that we value them. And I think we do. Um, and so it's been really nice to see some of them that were kind of sleepy, get really active and, um, and, and see, uh, people come together to support those organizations. And, um, you know, we, we can take no credit for that. You know, we, uh, well, I mean, I've seen you volunteering out there, Nick. Um, so I do, what, I do what I can. I do what I can. Some shovel work on this, but you know, we want to, we want to lift up and forward. The, the message of these organizations that exist and, and also learn how to uh, break down barriers so that others can come into being, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's where we can really be helpful because we have all these public policy chops and the, the sort of boring elements of our personality that will actually sit through the meetings and get that element of the work done, which is, is lowering barriers to entry so that people can so that more of these can come into being. So, you know, we yeah. want to preserve the ones that are there. We want to bring more. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so th that's, that's really great. And so we are about to wrap up here. And we do have some information uh, that just came through from Wilson. Uh, this is coming from Wilson Bowling, not directly to us, but I guess he posted about this. Um, and Wilson Bowling is the new neighborhood planner for Lubbock. Um, but there is a apparently a UDC open house meeting on uh, next Thursday. Um, that's next Thursday that, um, or this Thursday. It just says Thursday. So uh, we'll 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 let everybody know. Yeah, we'll let everybody know if it's if it's tomorrow or if it's uh, next Thursday. But that would be a Citizens Tower lobby, um, not the flooded part. Um, and there's going to be a joint uh, city council and planning and zoning meeting, I guess, at five on Thursday as well. And oh, that's so, that next Thursday then. That is next Thursday. Then. Okay, got you. So next Thursday. So we're talking about the 25th. Um, yeah, next super, Thursday. Super important for people to show up to that. Um, we definitely we need public comments. Um, we need engagement on this topic, um, especially for those of you who are, are passionate or, or care about the older parts of our city or, or the already built parts of our city. We really need to start advocating to make sure that zoning reform uh, isn't lost in this conversation and that the, the new things that we're doing for new neighborhoods, we also are doing things to correct the challenges of zoning uh, in our older areas. So yeah, Thursday, definitely 
give public comment. If, if, if this, these right now, um, you're, you're just, these are just written ones and then they read them off. You know, so if, if you're shy and, and you don't want to stand in front and, and you're, that was the reason why you don't want to do it, um, the city staff will be reading your comment for you. Um, so please, uh, you know, between now and, and next Thursday, uh, we'll try to talk about this and uh, make sure that people are informed, uh, but definitely uh, engage in this topic. Uh, we need public uh, input and support on this. And to the council's credit, they extended the contract with the UDC consultants um, through most of this year, specifically so that they could hear more from us. Um, so that they could hear more from the citizenry to make sure that our input was heard. So, so please do that and engage. Awesome. So we have we have some clarity on that. So Wednesday uh, at six thirty to seven thirty is the open house, um, which would be the twenty fourth. So six thirty to seven thirty at Citizens Tower is the open house, and that is where they're they're going to have some information uh, for folks who may not have. I mean, obviously, probably haven't followed that situation. Um, but last time they had like some posters up with some pictures, information that you could look over to kind of get up to speed on what they're talking about. Um, but the, the most important thing about it, uh, I mean, obviously that's good to get informed and go check it out. Um, and then, you know, the next important part is, uh, actually making those public comments, um, like Nick said, and that's kind of going to be a theme that you'll hear us talk about a lot over and over, because when, when you look at what goes on, like how policy is actually made, a lot of that goes through these boards first, and then the boards pass on recommendations um, to the city council, the city council may discuss it, go back and forth with it, and then they ultimately vote on it. So the boards play a big role in all of this. And so um, we, we also will be letting everybody know, um, I, I believe the city is now taking applications again for the boards. And so um, we, we do post those. So follow us on Facebook, uh, Lubbock Compact. You can go to our website at lubbockcompact.com. And uh, this has been Lubbock Compact Live's first episode. Thank you to Josh Shankles, uh, coordinator for Garden City Initiative and all the work that he has been doing. He, he does a whole lot. I know he's uh, very humble, um, but he, he definitely uh, does a whole lot and uh, folks rarely get to see him. So it's always a pleasure to have him uh, come and talk about kind of all the things that he's taken in over this time. Um, and of course, Dr. Nick, uh, always keeping us up to date on, on the city side of things. He has a lot of experience in that and is definitely still in that circle very much. And so uh, good, good thing to have Dr. Nick on here. And then I'm just the guy that runs my mouth uh, and, uh, you know, occasionally makes public statements on behalf of Love of Compact uh, and some other things. But anyway, Love of Compact Live first episode. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, we're about a minute and a half early. Okay. I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your evening and tune in next week on Wednesday from seven to eight. Uh, this will be every Wednesday from seven to eight. Next week, we will be going further into the charter reform issue, uh, why that's important, what we're doing, what is needed. Um, and so please tune in for that. Thank you, everybody. Good night.